Greetings collectors and welcome to today's retro game review. Often when I'm talking with retro game collectors and browsing forums, one series above all keeps on returning as a series that defined their early gaming years. That series is Gauntlet. The problem is that Gauntlet is not just a game series, it's a whole history of gaming. A single episode just wouldn't do its legacy justice. So I thought we'd go big with this one in an ambitious 10 part miniseries. Welcome to the Gauntlet. Just to head off any disappointment, I won't be reviewing every version of every edition of Gauntlet, there's just simply not enough time for that, and to be honest that makes for quite a different show. Instead I'll be focusing on the main editions of the game for each major iteration of the series. So yes, you can expect Gauntlet on pretty much every 1980s microcomputer, but I'll condense the series to one of the major releases but we'll go outside the boundaries where necessary to give you a decent feel for each era. Loosely speaking, there are 9 distinct major game releases in the Gauntlet series to date. However, there are several variants, expansion packs and notable differences between titles of the same name and differences between the arcade and home editions. For the purposes of this series, I've grouped some of the titles together and also assigned them into 3 distinct eras of the franchise timeline the Classic Era, the Legends Era and the Modern Era. These aren't strictly an official categorisation, but do help make sense out of how and why the game changed over the years. Where possible, each major release of the game will get its own episode. With that said, welcome Green Elf and Wizard Don't Shoot the Food because we have a long journey ahead of us. Whether you're a seasoned veteran of the series or completely new to the franchise, I hope there's something for everyone on our quest as we revisit this classic series. So what makes a Gauntlet game? Personally, I feel that there are 10 key elements that make a traditional Gauntlet game. You needn't have all of them in every game, but at least a good dose of them to generate a true Gauntlet experience. Hack and Slash whether it's the first game in the series or the last, expect to be slashing your way to victory. The controls of Gauntlet are usually rather simple. For most of the 2D editions, there is a one button fire mechanism to launch your projectile. Should you come face to face with the enemy, you'll also automatically fight hand to hand by pushing into them. Unsurmountable odds. It doesn't matter which game it is, you have to be outnumbered by hordes of enemies in Gauntlet for it to count. It's sometimes intimidating and certainly a spectacle, but it's 100% fun. The Heroes Over the years the formula hasn't been changed too much, but expect the 4 main classes of Elf, Wizard, Valkyrie and Warrior to choose from. Certain games will let you customise their colour, but whichever you choose, choose wisely, as they will each have their own class dependent stats. More on this later. Multiplayer so, you have your heroes, now find 3 friends. Without a doubt, Gauntlet is best played as a group experience. Whether you're cooperating or trying to do each other over, a shared adventure is what Gauntlet is all about. More players, more fun and a key component to the Gauntlet scenario. The Dungeons You simply can't have a Gauntlet game without the dungeons. Often classed as a hack and slash dungeon crawler, it's the nature of running Gauntlet's dungeons that make the games tick. Expect a wide variety of styles and even bonus treasure rooms. The Monsters and Spawn Points Expect bad guys to slay, lots of them, and they will keep coming. One key element of the game structure are the summoning bases. These will summon more enemies until they're destroyed. You can run past them quite freely, but beware, they will keep spawning. Keys, Potions and Pickups the classic formula sees you navigate the gauntlet and occasionally requiring a key to unlock an area. Store keys and use them wisely. Potions can restore health, but watch out for those poison potions that will damage your health. Additionally, pick up destructive magic potions to clear areas of monster at a time. Certain games will also include a variety of pickups, such as Reflective Shot or the You Are It curse, to keep the game fresh. Red Warrior now has Reflective Shot. The Announcer. All good Gauntlet games feature the announcer, most often telling you that you're about to die. Thor is dead. At the time, this was a revelation, and it clearly puts you in mind that your game is being overseen by an omnipotent dungeon master. Death. He's coming for you, and he's coming now, so run. One of the starring characters in the Gauntlet series is Death himself. 
he is one of the harder monsters to defeat, so ironically has a lot of life himself, but has the ability to drain yours like no other, you have been warned. Shooting the food A staple throughout the series has been the notion of shooting food. Food is a valuable resource in the gauntlet for much needed health. Shoot it and you're bound to regret it. Since your character's life bar is always depleting and acting as a natural timer to the end of your credit, food is amongst the most sought after resources in the gauntlet. You can be sure that a gauntlet game containing these 10 key elements is going to be a winner. With all that said, our journey begins with the classic era. For this episode, I'd like to start with the first commercially available Gauntlet games. The classic era began back in the arcade in 1985. Developed and published by Atari, Gauntlet became a multiplayer cult classic. It was great action for the casual gamer and a revelation in multiplayer excitement. Simply choose your favourite character and take on the quest with up to three friends. Gauntlet proved to be a well executed concept in the arcade for several reasons. Firstly, the ability to have friends join you at any time during the game. This is sometimes known as rolling play. Rather than one quarter per play into the machine, why not open up the opportunity to have four? A clear step up from a traditional one player experience. This ability to drop into a game at any time to join a friend also made for a more flexible experience. The four classes also allowed for instant variety and favourite characters to be chosen. This was a winning formula. It wasn't long until home versions of Gauntlet arrived, and that's where I'd like to start today, with the release of the original Gauntlet on the home systems. So, as mentioned, Gauntlet was released on just about every microcomputer of the day. The NES and even the Sega Master System had editions. It's fair to say that pretty much all of the editions were well received. Gauntlet in its raw state was never about fancy graphics, it was all about the hack and slash dungeon crawling. Choosing your class has an impact on the way you play the game. Merlin the Wizard has low armour but powerful magic. Thor the Warrior is low on magic but has powerful damage and armour. Quest of the Elf is fast but has low armour and Thyra the Valkyrie is a little more balanced all round, having strong armour but average shot power and speed. Most game manuals will give you some decent details on the characters, their starting stats and a basic strategy. This class system made for a variety in game, but no need to relearn how to play. The basics were the same, yet nuanced by class variation. It's something that most Dungeons and Dragons players will be more than familiar with. It's a testament to great game mechanics. There is in fact a backstory to Gauntlet. Morak the Evil One has created a terrible gauntlet in which he has imprisoned a sacred orb in the lowest level. Without this orb, mortals that inhabit the land of Randar will be helpless against his evil magic. Enter our four heroes and some serious pixel kicking is going to go down in an attempt to retrieve it. It's perhaps not going to win any prizes for best story, but really it's the action we came for. The general aim of the game is to simply traverse the floors of the gauntlet to get to the last level by destroying anything that moves. As you can see here from the footage, here the gameplay is very much rinse and repeat, but with a decent variety of level designs thrown in. Typically, you'll need to destroy the monster spawning bases to stop the spread of the monsters, find any available keys to unlock your path, and find that iconic black exit tile. Gauntlet's simplicity had great impact on the way that it would be rocketed to its iconic status early in its life cycle. It was an instant hit with gamers. Even in the arcade, the graphics were simple because that's all they needed to be. The gameplay was the real star of the show. This had the fortunate quirk that it would also be easy to replicate on the home systems. So what exactly did we receive in the home market? Obviously the arcade was king, but the home editions were a success in their own right. Here I have three of the more mainstream releases. Gauntlet for the Spectrum Microcomputer, Gauntlet for the Nintendo Entertainment System, and Gauntlet for the Sega Master System. Now what's likely to strike you here is the difference in presentation style. The Spectrum edition leans heavily on the original arcade artwork, both on the front cover and the internal manuals. The internal manual is actually more of a sheet so that it could fit in with the original cassette case. Collectors will really appreciate the original Atari artwork here and the presentation feels very faithful to the arcade original release. 
The explanation of the hero classes is very well defined and match the original release. All the pickups and monsters are also very well defined here. Interestingly, Death will take up to 200 points before dying himself, and the only way to kill him is with magic. Although still published by Atari Games, the task fell to US Gold to create the conversion, and considering the limitations of the hardware, the game still holds a lot of charm of the original source material. The visuals are basic but overall quite pleasing. The Spectrum sound chip also puts out some decent bleeps and bloops. Overall, a decent conversion in my opinion. Next up is the Nintendo Entertainment System version of Gauntlet, and a change of pace in presentation. In 1984, Atari had been broken up into two distinct divisions, the Atari Games Division and the Atari Corporation. The Atari Games Division originated from Atari's arcade division, and had the rights to use the Atari name on arcade releases, but not on console or computer games. As you can imagine, this led to several platform restrictions. The Atari Corporation division held the remit for publishing on computer and console games, and hardware which owned the rights to the Atari brand for these platforms. It was for this reason when Atari Games Division wanted to enter the console game market, they needed to create a new label that did not use the Atari name. This new subsidiary would be known as Tengen. What I have here is the US NTSC first pressing of Gauntlet by Tengen for the NES. Notice in the bottom right corner, it lacks the Nintendo seal of quality that was found on most games of the day. This is because Tengen and Atari had a rather long running dispute over game licensing for the system. Atari wanted to release games, but at the time failed to secure the appropriate deal with Nintendo. As a result, there are Tengen games out there that are fully compatible with the NES, but were not endorsed or licensed by Nintendo. On most NES games, you would expect to see the licensing message from Nintendo. Curiously, these were never awarded to several Tengen releases. There is a long and interesting history of licensing issues between Atari, Tengen and Nintendo, and worth an episode in its own right. It is worth including this hint of a crack in Atari early on though, as it does give some context as to Atari's troubles in later years, and very relevant to the Gauntlet story. Either way, Tengen did a reasonable job of converting Gauntlet to the NES in my opinion. The game retains all of the hallmarks of the arcade original, and does feel like a Gauntlet title. The colour palette may be a little uninspired, but you can definitely still get some fun out of this one when you sit down with it even today. It gets the job done, but in retrospect the conversion could have been a little more faithful to the original, and the graphics improved even more. Now, I'm actually really fond of this title as it's not easy to come by here in the UK. As such, this is one game that needs to be housed in a game protector due to its age and great condition. I dare say that over the years, near mint conditions are now only in the hands of the more serious Gauntlet collector. In terms of the physical presentation, the artwork is really decent here. It just looks epic and has that quintessential 1980s Dungeons and Dragons feel to it. Even the gold trim makes it look like part of the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Take a mental note of this artwork, as it has a part to play in our story later on. Inside, expect to find a decent clean cartridge of the same design along with manual. The cartridge is a nice black variant used by Tengen, and actually feels very robust. The manual is also really decent. You'll get the backstory, game setup details, character stats, explanation of the abilities, the map system, overview of the monsters and items. Interestingly, here is the description of death. In this variant of the game, your shots have no effect on death. So, a great package so far. The real star of the show though, must be the original poster. These are now becoming exceptionally rare to find these days, and I don't mind sharing that I bought this complete set just for this episode. The iconic artwork of the wizard, warrior, valkyrie and elf is just stunning. For Gauntlet collectors, this is a true collectible, and you'll see later why the artwork has a larger piece to play in the saga. Overall, the NES version of Gauntlet really sets the standard in terms of a physical presentation. I'm a fan of the black Sega Mega Drive cartridges, and seeing a NES game in a similar black is surprisingly rewarding. Now, back into the protective sleeve and temperature controlled vault with you, never to be seen again. Lastly, it is worth taking a look at the Sega Master System edition of Gauntlet, also converted by US Gold as the Commodore 64 version had been. 
The cover art? Well, I kind of like it. US Gold could have used the original Atari artwork, but decided to go their own way with this one. The characters lack the more detailed finish of the Tengen release, however they do have more of a comic book charm and the distinct yellow, red, blue and green distinction of the heroes is definitely more pronounced. Inside the manual is decent, yet nothing to shout about. What should be shouted about though is the gameplay and presentation of the game itself. Remember the NES version? It was okay and captured the essence of the original. The NES's big rival here in Europe, the Sega Master System, what could it deliver though? The Sega 8-bit edition? Wow, just incredible. For my tastes, the US Gold conversion on the Sega Master System is perhaps the best conversion I've played. The colour palette is much richer than the NES, the playfield wider than the Commodore 64, and the overall speed and flow of the game replicates the arcade edition in a very pleasing way. The game also sounds great. The sound of the keys, the treasure, it's all executed in a really comprehensive way. I dare say that the Sega Master System also ups the ante by throwing in more sprites, more complex level designs such as the teleportation death level, and just performs really well with multiple sprite movements. Something which was not the console's strong point. The bonus treasure levels are all in here too, so I'd happily recommend this as the addition to pick up if you're looking for a quality 8-bit release. Now this is something that isn't obvious to game collectors. US Gold had a reputation for being a bit hit and miss for conversions back in the 80s. What's also surprising is that the US Gold edition is technically superior to the Tengen release on the NES. Now we can argue up and down all day as gaming enthusiasts on whether the Commodore 64, Master System or NES was the better machine for running Gauntlet, they all have their strong points. However, in a straight NES versus Master System duel, I can only conclude that US Gold did a better job at conversion than Tengen. Here they are side by side and I will leave it to you to decide on your opinion. However, considering Tengen was a subsidiary of Atari itself, you would expect that Tengen would set the standard when it came to execution. Instead, we have a curious situation where the most faithful recreation of the game sits on a Sega console with a third party publisher, a curious note in the Gauntlet series. To this day, all three formats play very well and there's definitely some room for debate here on which edition is the most fun, faithful to the original or best executed. If I could have the NES packaging with the Master System game execution, I'd be a very happy gamer. No matter the platform of choice, gamers agreed unanimously that there was demand for a follow-up. Atari had already begun work on Gauntlet 2. However, Atari made a clever move in announcing an expansion pack to several microcomputer versions of the game. This led to what was known as the Deeper Dungeons. Deeper Dungeons has an unusual legacy in the fact that it was partially created by fans of the game. Atari wanted more content, but didn't want to distract themselves from the true up-and-coming Gauntlet 2 release. But it was clear that Atari wanted a lot of content to make Deeper Dungeons worth buying. As such, a competition was launched where budding level designers could submit level designs to win copies of the final game and a Gauntlet t-shirt. So, back to our original Commodore 64 release. The eagle-eyed of you will have noticed earlier the Deeper Dungeons competition section. It was always planned that US Gold would release the Deeper Dungeons expansion pack in 1987, but needed help. Gamers were asked to design levels and send them in for a chance for their level to be in the expansion pack, as well as winning that copy of the game and a t-shirt. How to do that exactly? Well, it's time to get out your squared paper. The Gauntlet Universe grid is 32 by 32 blocks and the player's window scrolls so that 16 blocks wide and 10 tall are seen at any one time. All gamers had to do was follow the key to place walls, monsters, generators, exits and pickups. What a creative way for Gauntlet fans to join in the fun. The result? A rather well received expansion to the original, by the fans, for the fans. The expansion comes on cassette and does everything right. The imagery and presentation are spot on and oh how I want to go back to 1987 to order that t-shirt. 
Whilst it wasn't uncommon for gamers to make homebrew versions of games, this is perhaps one of the first times that a major publisher such as Atari had opened up its doors and welcomed in a team collaboration from fans. We praised Little Big Adventure in 2008 and Super Mario Maker as recently as 2015, seeing fan-made levels as an innovation. The truth is, Atari had already harnessed this fan resource to generate level content as far back as 1985. With 512 new levels, Atari and fans alike achieved a truly special thing in gaming, harmony for the greater good of creating an experience for everyone to enjoy. Atari made sales, the community had fun making the levels, and gamers in general benefited from more game content. Personally, I find this to be one of the most truly important moments in gaming history. It was one of the first true win-win-win situations the industry had ever experienced, certainly on this scale. Sadly, this time has become a bit of a footnote in the history of Atari and overshadowed by Atari's ultimate decline in popularity. It is worth remembering though that for some time Atari really was a very well-loved and respected player in the market. What I have here is the Spectrum expansion of the Deeper Dungeons and it does require the original cassette to load. Essentially, the original tape will load the main game whilst the nifty cassette swap will then continue to load the level schematics. None of this DLC nonsense, it's all about that cassette swap. The Deeper Dungeons was a decent distraction for microcomputer owners but never made available to the console crowd. With Gauntlet running rampant in the arcade and home systems, Gauntlet 2 needed to be a major release to keep the fans happy. With new consoles and computers on the market, Atari took the chance it needed to refine the Gauntlet formula further and deliver perhaps one of the most groundbreaking game experiences of the decade. Join me in part 2 as we unleash hell in Gauntlet 2. The quest continues.